All right, what's going on guys? Um, welcome to the Walleye Workshop Seminar. I would much rather be doing this in person, um, but due to recent events, it is, I think it is probably best um, that we just do it from here. So I hope you guys really enjoy this. And uh, this is actually the third one of these I've done, and I really put a lot of effort into making it as informational as absolutely possible. I hate the word seminars, um, because I feel like it's just somebody standing up there and doing a rant about kind of whatever they want. I truly want you guys to have the most practical and applicable app information you possibly can. I've done these on muskies, kind of multi-species stuff. This one is 100% focused on walleye fishing. And um, I truly believe that um, when, after we get done with this, you're going to have a much better understanding as far as how to find, target, and catch walleyes really throughout the entire open water season um, from start to finish. So we're going to get right into this, and uh, yeah, I hope you guys really enjoy it. And uh, if you have a bunch of questions, I'll kind of figure out something, um, a way that we can uh, have some questions answered after this too. So. Moving on to number two here. This is the process, right? This is what this seminar is about. It's about the process. How do you get to a new lake? Like you've been on for the first time or maybe a million times and uh, break it down kind of based on the season. So the goal of this presentation is I want you to feel confident in going to a new body of water any time of year and have the ability to find and catch walleyes or at least believe that you, you, know, you have a great shot at going out and being successful that day, right? This is a step-by-step -step process which I follow in targeting walleyes all year long on any body water. The specifics might change, um, the time of years might change, the exact structural location is, might change a little bit, um, but a lot of this um, is 100% what I'm doing every single day on the water from start to finish, from you know April uh, to November when I'm in a boat. So um, it can be difficult to really know where to start. I think that's where most guys probably struggle. Is it lure, location, am I using side imaging, GPS, trolling, casting, G what am I doing out there? Um, so this is kind of a, uh, this is like I said, this is the problem. Process. It breaks it down when you get to a lake, what time of year is it, what are the water temps, what's this, what's that. And really as technology improves, so do our options as fishermen, right? Um, you know, 30, 40 years ago it was much easier because you only had, what, a couple jigs, a couple crankbaits and this and a Lindy rig maybe, and sonar, right? Um, so it changes a lot now. You know, we have so many different options as far as how to find fish, what's best, what's the best for this situation versus this situation, and then presentation-wise, what's best when fish are here? Is it a jig, is it a crankbait, is it trolling, is it casting? Um, what is it? So that is what I really break down in this from start to finish. And uh, like I said, this is kind of an overview of it right here. Um, you know, water temp, we're gonna go to season, location, how, once you know where those fish are or you've found some like locations, you know, how do you really see those fish? And then we're going to move on to presentations from there. So this is the overview. This is kind of what um, the format in which we're going to follow throughout this presentation as we move through throughout the seasons, right? And we're going to start chronologically with spawn and spring. Um, so, you know, this is kind of the first thing that all of us are going to be fishing here. Some guys probably are. I'm going to be in about eight hours fishing this bite, hopefully. Um, but this is pre-spawn walleyes, spawn walleyes, post-spawn walleyes. And really, the, this whole time frame um, from right now until the water is 50 degrees um, is kind of all dictated by the spawning cycle. You know, fish might only spawn for a sliver of that time, um, but they're either in a pre-spawn staging to spawn, they're spawning, or they're moving away from a spawning location and they're in the post-spawn period, right? So we're gonna call this 32 to 50 degrees. Now pre-spawn is generally 32 to 40 degrees. And uh, the spawn is generally 40 to 47. That window is a little bit larger than it probably actually is. But a lot of this depends on how quickly or slowly this water warms or cools. If the water warms very, very slowly and just hangs at 41 for a while, you're probably going to see fish spawning. Now, if that water just all of a sudden shoots up extremely quick, it might take those fish a couple of days of leg time until they start dumping eggs, right? Um, so it all kind of depends a little bit more on that. But generally, the tightest window you're going to see is like, you know, 42 to like 45 degrees. That's kind of like peak as far as what I see for fish spawning. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean fishing will be better than, generally fishing is better post-spawn, but as far as um, how the cycle goes, that's what I see the most of. So, first thing, location, right? Spawning locations, where do fish spawn? Where do walleye spawn? Well, it's not no secret that almost all fish spawn in shallow water, right? Um, walleyes especially love any kind of current, any kind of inflow coming into a system. Um, that's not a surprise to most of us. Um, they obviously want warmer water. A lot of times you might see a basin of a lake being like 37 and a shallow section of this lake with an inflow being 44 and there's fish spawning. So keep that in mind. These spots where walleye spawn are generally shoreline oriented. It's generally not a spot three miles off the shoreline where these fish are spawning. Does a little bit of that happen? 
maybe, um, but uh, your best spawning flat spawning areas are almost always shoreline related. And generally these spots are less than 10 feet. Um, so kind of what are we looking for? What kind of spots are these fish holding on when, they, or when they're about to spawn, spawning, or just post spawn? Well, it's generally not a very soft bottom area. Generally looking for rock, gravel, or sand. Some kind of hard bottom that fish can lay eggs on. And this is normally always what walleyes are using um, during this cycle, right? So next we go to our GPS and start breaking this down, right? This is what we're looking for right here. You can see we have a large shoreline right here, oriented flat. The flat is all less than 10 feet, which is what I have highlighted in red is 10 and less. Then you have kind of that first break highlighted in green. But when these fish are spawning, they're definitely gonna be way up there. Throughout the spawning cycle, these fish might kind of push in and out depending on water temp. If all of a sudden it cools down, they might kind of suck back out closer to the break. Warms up, they might be way up shallow. Um, a lot of us have probably seen this happen. And a real common thing, like I have large flats listed here. And I have a very simple philosophy when I'm on a new lake or looking for fish in an unfamiliar area. I want big spots with the highest carrying capacity, the most potential for fish to be there, right? Um, we, I think a lot of guys have the idea that they're looking for this small little secret spot way in the back of here. Um, that's just mathematically not gonna catch you more fish in the long haul, right? You want big spots, big potential, right? And you might strike out on a few of these spots, but eventually the big spots always pay off. And uh, like I have listed here, Near shore humps, very important. Um, you know, it, it, if you are gonna fish a hump this time of year, the closer it is to shore, the better off you generally are. And really these shoreline flats can be anything. They can be a, they can be a big point complex, they can be a big kind of interlocked reef close to shore. Uh, but like I said, you want near shore this time of year for sure. Here's another one. You know, I get a lot of guys ask me about flowages or river systems. And obviously we're looking for large flats this time of year as well or the image on the left, a lot of complexity close to an inflow. Both of these images have inflow. One's right here, one's right here. On this one, we have this big shallow flat right on the inside corner of a river. This is gonna be a great spot um, to fish walleyes throughout the spawning cycle, really. And this one, we have a lot of complexity right here in the islands and all these little humps kind of right next to this inflow. So if you're a flowage guy or river guy, this is kind of what you're looking for there. Now, once you kind of found these spots on the GPS, right? Spots that look like they could have potential to fit the description that we're looking for. The next thing we need to do is how do you find structure, whether that's rock or uh, gravel in these areas, and how do you find fish in these areas, right? Um, so what are we really looking for? Well, whenever you're fishing shallow water, side imaging is your best friend, really whether you're looking for fish or structure, right? Like you can see the diagram here. Imagine this is your sonar cone, and this is five feet. Well, you're just not picking up very much. You're not gonna have a very great idea of what that bottom's actually like just on sonar or down imaging versus if you were in 25 feet where you get this much bigger picture, right? So side imaging is your best friend. You know, it's shooting out like this. So you can see everything around you versus just that one foot of the bottom if you're up in five feet of water. So um, like I said, what are we really looking for as far as structure goes? Rock, gravel, or transition lines. Anywhere it goes from rock to sand, gravel to sand, big rock to intermediate rock, um, stuff like that. So the sweet spots are generally, you know, where you have like that best rock out on the tip of a point or uh, where you have really good structure right next to deep water. So keep those couple things in mind. I talk a lot about sweet spots um, as far as just looking at a spot and maybe if there's not fish there now being like, that's the spot on the spot. When there's fish here, they're gonna be right there. Um, so, and a lot of times those are like the best rock, the best weeds, the best structure right next to deep water, things like that. So here we have a side imaging shot of what shallow rock would look like. Now, most of this bottom is either sand or gravel. And you can see if you're new to side imaging that we have great rock right here. And this is a lot of times what you're looking for. And a lot of times if you're fishing real big flats, you might have 15, 20 of these little you know, little sections of rock mixed throughout. But if you're gonna cast or troll and kind of connect the dots, these are the kind of things that you wanna be able to recognize right away as fish holding potential, right? Something that looks just like this right here. The next one, we have a shallow rock transition line. So this is actually a shot from Green Bay. Um, we have on the left here, we have a whole bunch of big rock. You're never gonna see fish with side imaging in rock that thick. The rock is too hard and the fish are also hard objects. So there's nothing that's really gonna give you a shadow on stuff like that to see the fish, right? 
The fish can't pop out if everything behind them is just as hard, right? Um, but what we have here is a transition line. You can see right here, this starts to go to more gravel stuff. And then right here, we have plain sand. This is a super clean, crisp transition line that happens on a lot of lakes. This is an absolute magnet for fish. It's kind of like the under underwater like highway. You know, those fish come up to the rock, they hit that transition, and they swim right along it. Smallmouth walleyes, muskies, everything uses stuff like this. And then you can see highlighted in the black circles here are my fish on side imaging. A lot of times you can see kind of a hard mark like that and then the shadow behind it. Sometimes the shadow might just be more obvious like that. But this is what a loaded spot would look like for sure. There's a ton of walleye sitting right in the sand on this transition line. There's probably a few up in the rock too, but I can't really see those with side imaging, right? So here's kind of your cookie cutter, best case scenario, what a fish looks like. You can see the streak right here. And then obviously you get a super clean, crisp shadow. All these shots are ones that I've screenshotted in the last year off my Hummingbird Helix 3 or Gen 3 Megas. Um, so if you guys have any questions on that, that is what I'm using. And a lot of times you get images like this when you hit a fish right, kind of with the, with the side imaging. So as far as identifying sweet spots go, right? Here we have in the black oval, you can see kind of like what would be the best rock on this spot. There's a couple of rocks over here. But you know, if you roll up on this spot and you're looking at a side and you're like, this is it, right? This is it right here. And you can kind of tell the way the bottom goes, kind of comes up like that and goes over, that we kind of passed right over the top of it with the boat, right? So it's probably shallower here than it is right here, right? So, you know, you found the spot, what's the next thing you do to really effectively fish this? Well, what I like to do is I drop waypoints. I'm very heavy on the amount of waypoints I drop, but I feel like it keeps me much more kind of you know accurately focused on where these fish are so you can see like let's say I dropped a waypoint here and what I normally do is I drop waypoints on the best rock when I see it right so right here is some real good rock right here's some real good rock there's some good rock here and there's some good rock on this side also so let's say I got my side imaging open I scroll over drop waypoint 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 well when I open up my GPS what I'm gonna see is something that looks right like this right here so this black line was the route in which my boat took Here's the three waypoints I dropped off the left, and here's the one off the right. Now this tells me a couple of things. All right, so this best rock is right out on the tip, number one. That's a great sign. It's a very isolated piece of rock, um, or it's not very wide, which is very good, because that really hones in on exactly where I have to be fishing, right? So a lot of good things there, and this is absolutely a spot that I would want to fish. So, you know, wherever this wind's coming from, I would spot lock just outside, cast back over it, and uh, start fishing through that stuff. Now, sand flats are another one that we fish a lot in the spring. Now, sand flat bites are tough to get on because if you look at a map, it's really hard to just look at look at a map and say that's going to be a great sand spot, right? Um, a lot of times these spots, the easiest way to get on them are very big areas. Get on the biggest, slow tapering shoreline that comes off. And also, something that extends out into the main lake. A lot of times sand flats and like the back of bays or little things like this are much less productive. Um, and if you have a quick break on the outside of this, it makes it much easier. Like a lot of the ones I fish in northern Wisconsin, northern Minnesota, are these big, long, tapering sand flats that get out to about eight feet and they just go boom, right out to the basin. Well, most of the time those fish sit right up on that lip. It might be five feet here and five feet 200 yards this way, but if you have 20 feet right here, most of the time those fish right there, and it acts as a great kind of blockade for those fish. They're not gonna be in 25 feet in early May. So right on the edge of that five foot lip is right where we wanna be in sand. And this is a side imaging picture of what a lot of walleyes would look like. You can kind of tell the boats twisting and turning a little bit here, but this is what they look like. There's nothing else up on this sand flat that would mark like this. There's no rock up here. These are 100% all walleyes. And uh, I took that screenshot up here in Hayward this May. Another thing you kind of look for is where the wind's blowing in there. Sand has no holding power, right? There's no cover there. There's no weeds there. There's no big rock there for those fish to gravitate to. So if you have wind coming up there, um, it gives those fish a little bit cover and they feel much more at home being up on these shallow sand flats with some wind blowing around. So kind of getting into presentations here in the spring, there's two different ways you can go. And there's really two different ways you can go for a lot of the season. And spring's no different. Is it going to be a casting bite or is it going to be a trolling bite or what are you going to do when you get there? Well, one of the first questions you have to ask yourself is are the fish scattered or concentrated, right? Um, and it, obviously if they're very, very scattered, it would make more sense to troll. As long as that spot is large enough to troll, number one, with a bunch of planer boards or 
if the depth is uniform enough where you control it. Like if it's a two feet deep here and six feet deep here and all the walleyes are in six feet and then it goes back down to seven and then it comes back up to one, that's gonna be a tough spot to troll, right? But if it's all kind of like nine to like, let's say four feet of water, this is gonna be trollable because you can kind of stagger your baits and run the spread. Now, if the fish are all concentrated, if there's five big pods of fish in this spot, and one's here, one's over here, one's over here, you're going to be much better off just casting for those fish, right? Instead of wasting all the time between those pods of fish. So a lot of times when I set up a trolling spread or I'm thinking about it, those are kind of some of the things I think about. So as far as spring shallow water presentations go, um, this is exactly what we're using 99% of the time. And I would say, you know, jig and minnow is obviously the killer. A ton of us use that in the spring and for good reason. It's the fail safe. It always works, right? Um, it's a great option. And um, most of the time we're fishing that on an eighth or a quarter this time of year, ounce head. As far as artificials go, I probably use more artificials than I do live bait, hands down. And one of my absolute favorites is the Kalen's Jerk Minnow Jr. Um, with a Google Eye jig in an eighth or a quarter. And uh, um, artificials absolutely kill fish. Um, they uh, um, are very effective really throughout the entire year. And like I said, I catch more fish on artificials than live bait for sure. Another one is a swim bait. Um, a Kitek Swim Impact 3 inch um, is a great option. I fish a ton of those. Um, they have great movement to them, just a great swim bait overall. And I don't fish a lot of crankbaits in the spring on the cast. Um, in most of the lakes I fish, but on some lakes it's absolutely dynamite. And basically what you want is some kind of suspending stick bait. Something like the Smithwick suspending rogue right here, Rapala Husky Jerk. Any of your suspending jerk baits or twitch baits are going to be great. And generally you're casting those out and you're kind of doing a pump pause, pump pause, or a lot of times just kind of a slow roll and get that bait just kicking down there. So we're going to go into kind of the spring pop jig here. This is what I'd be using with like a Kalen's Jerk Minnow Jr. Fish on. We're gonna hook up. Nice walleye here. Pop jig and some shallows. We're gonna need a net in this one, Mitchell. This is a beauty favorite area walleye. You gonna net this fish for me or no? It's right there. Those are the ones we're after. All right, guys, there it is. First little walleye of the afternoon there. It's a quality fish, probably a 23 inch Hayward area walleye. That one came out one of my absolute favorite pop jig and baits. I've talked about it a whole ton on social media, but it's the Kalen's Jerk Minnow Jr. Just a super effective bait for twitching up in the shallows. You know, you can work them soft, you can work them hard. Um, and there's a beautiful Hayward area walleye right there. So you can see the way I'm working that, right? I'm not ripping the rod like crazy. When this water's cold, I want to keep it close to the bottom. I'm just going pop, 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 pop. The same goes with the jig and the minnow this time of year as we're about to watch in the next video here. fish on the side imaging. I made a lot of cash for those ones though. I'm gonna have to grab my net. Now sand's a tough one to get on because a lot of times there's not any like you know verifiable proof that you're on the right uh, you know, it's hard to it's hard to look at a, a map of sand and say that's going to be a good spot. But basically, just run a lot of sight imaging. You know, anytime um, you know it, you're fishing sand or know the fish are on sand, sight imaging is an absolute uh, must because it's basically the only way you're going to see those fish. And without any obstructions in the way, like rock or weeds, you can see real good and you can see everything around you. So that's fish and sand. Um, like I said, that's how I'd work a jig and a minnow pretty much anywhere in the spring. That was on an eighth ounce, but you notice I'm not doing any of those big rips with my rod. It's much slower. Same goes with like fishing a swim bait in the spring. You're not taking that thing and snapping it real hard. It's just lift, fall, lift, fall, lift, fall. Um, but that's basically what you want to do. You want to keep that bait close to bottom in the spring, especially when that water is very cold and you guys are going to be much more um, successful. 
So the other end of spring presentations is obviously trolling. I do a lot of trolling in the spring, especially after dark. Um, my speeds when I'm trolling are much slower, obviously, in the spring than they are in the middle of summer. It's a lot of like 0.8 to 1.5, kind of the sweet spot I'd say is right around 1, 1, 1, 1, um, especially in that early season period when we're talking about the spawning cycle overall. And uh, a lot of the same casting baits are great this time of year for trolling, your Rapala Husky Jerks and 11s, your Smithwick Perfect 10s, Perfect 8s, great trolling baits, and one absolute killer, which I don't know if a lot of guys are using yet, but has been absolutely deadly for us, especially like on the Fox, um, or a lot of these systems that have current, um, or wind-driven current, is the Rapala Scatter Wrap and a Balsam Minnow. Now, this is a very buoyant bait, um, but basically when we're trolling it, we get that thing down there close to bottom and you can see it's got that curved lip on it if you're not familiar with the scatter wrap series um, but it's got a curved lip on it which gives it erratic action it does what a crankbait guy calls a walking crankbait what that means is that bait's coming along and all of a sudden it kind of kicks out and comes back to center kicks out this way comes back to center and you can imagine that bait moving super slow into current like out on the fox river or after dark and a wall it gets behind that thing and you know, that crankbait's just kind of barely going, and all of a sudden it pops out to the side and comes back to center. It is one of the biggest triggering qualities a crankbait can have, and it's one of my absolute favorite um, early season stick baits to troll, um, for sure. It's been an absolute killer.